Hello and welcome. Thank you for coming to today's Atticus Advantage Growth Essentials webinar. My name is Mike Wells and I am the uh, moderator for today's session. I'll be in the background. Um, I want to introduce our presenter today, Glenn Gutek. Glenn is a practice advisor with Atticus. He also is a facilitator with two of our Dominate Your Market program groups. Uh, and uh, Glenn has uh, served as a principal consultant and coach for a company that coached executives as well. Um, and he, his knowledge and passion um, for help creating healthy corporate cultures and law firm cultures is really what drives him. Glenn has been with Atticus many years and um, he has a, a fantastic ability to um, motivate uh, people on uh, online sessions and in person as well. So I want to thank you, Glenn, for leading today's presentation. You have a lot of important material to cover, and uh, I want to give you as much time as possible. So thank you so much. Oh, Mike, thank you. And uh, I kind of chuckle when you say it's been a lot of years, because um, it has been a lot of years. I, I've been... Uh, with Atticus now for for 20 years, and so uh, let me just uh, remind you what we do. Back in 1989, uh, Mark Powers and Sean McNallis uh, uh, formed an organization that really was designed initially to help uh, lawyers market their practice, uh, recognizing that that was a weakness of theirs. Um, and then they realized then they realized that not only did they struggle with marketing, but they struggled with time management, and then they struggled with staff, uh, their staff and so they put together uh, Atticus and uh, tried to figure out what are the resources that attorneys need to help them increase their income and decrease their stress and decrease their time in the practice and really increase the overall level of satisfaction that attorneys experience leading their practice. And so we do that through programs that we do, workshops that we do, webinars that we do, coaching that we do, all designed to help really good lawyers become great entrepreneurial leaders in their practice. So uh, we work with uh, the solo and small firms. We work with managing partners and leaders in, in large firms. We work with professional associations uh, that, uh, that, that serve attorneys. Uh, and essentially, we work with attorneys from what we call the beginning to the end, from the start to the exit. And uh, as, as I shared earlier, there's a variety of resources. You can go to our website, familiarize yourself with the options and services that are best for you, um, because we, uh, we would love to see you enjoy leading your practice and uh, benefiting from your expertise. So we, you know, historically, we've asked this question, when you went into private practice, what did you really want? What did you hope you would get out of private practice? And the one question, the answer that crops up over and over again, man, is I want to control over my life. I want it more and more free time. When people ask me, what do I do for a living? I tell people I give attorneys back their lives um, because that's what attorneys want. They want to be able to be able to practice their expertise in a way that gives them some degree of freedom and control. And yet often that is not the experience that shows up. And so through our four cornerstone systems of time management, client development, staffing, cash flow and profitability by establishing these systems, we find that attorneys are able to increase their revenue, increase their personal income, increase the sense of control and freedom that they have, all the while uh, their firms and their teams are able to make a greater impact in the lives of their clients. And so uh, when attorneys bring to us great legal skills, we'll partner with them with those four cornerstone systems, and together you get to see the results that you've been looking for. And even today's webinar, is a part of our commitment to help make that happen. So um, as we launch, let me encourage you to grab a pencil and a paper because uh, you may want to take a lot of notes. We actually have some resources that are available to you. Uh, take advantage of them. And all of this is really help you uh, uh, today in particular to help you think about the reopening of your practice in your office in the post-COVID world. Um, so this session is interactive. Uh, if you have a question, uh, you can uh, uh, write the question in a chat box. You can get Mike's attention through the chat box. If Mike thinks that interrupting uh, right now to address that issue or to make something clearer, I'd be glad to do that uh, because the way I like to say it is I want to make sure that if you're spending your time here with us, I want to make sure that we're scratching where you're itching. So if you have an itch, let us know and uh, we'll make sure that we address it. So there's a couple of goals that I have for our conversation today is one, 
I, I really want you to feel like you have some tools and some handles and some structure to think through the process of reopening your office and how to keep it open in a way that um, all, state, all stakeholders uh, their well-being is considered, their well-being is, is taken care of, but you also are taking advantage of this in a way that gives you a competitive advantage by your forethought um, and your access to some of the resources that we're going to provide in this conversation today. You actually get to gain a competitive advantage. And, um, and then to, to, to begin to sort of see how do you use the time right now, the strategic time, um, if there are ways in which you can help grow your practice. So, um, so let, let's, let's launch into the conversation related to reopening your office. Uh, first of all, uh, there are four mistakes that I really want you to avoid in this process. And uh, I'll label them as not anticipating well, or acting as if this is not really a big deal. And because you're not anticipating or thinking of it as a big deal, you just don't do the preparation that you need to do. And if you don't do those three things, you're going to make the biggest mistake of all, and that is not communicating. So let me flesh those out a little bit more in detail. Um, and not anticipating uh, is critical because, you know, those of us on this call were in different parts of the state, uh, in the states, we're different parts of the country. Different parts of the country are opening up faster than others. Um, some have more restrictions, some have less restrictions. Some of us are three or four weeks into this process. Uh, some of us may be three or four weeks away from this process. And I, I don't care where you are. You really want to be looking ahead and getting a sense of when may it be possible for you to open your office? When does it, might it make sense? Because if you anticipate well, you can be ready with everything that you need to have in place when the opportunity arises um, and avoid the mistake of sort of keeping pace with the work that's in front of you, then all of a sudden, okay, we, we can't open the, up, the, up the office, we should, and you haven't done the groundwork and you find out that it's not as easy as you thought. Um, by the way, some of you may have been considered essential and never really closed your offices. I don't want you discounting this conversation even if that's the case because what is a real key factor is, is you may not have closed your offices, but there are stakeholders like referral sources or clients who may have assumed that you went virtual and you closed the office. So you have to anticipate not only uh, when the market may be ready for you to open again, but when the marketplace thinks that you should be ready to open again. And so you want to, you want to anticipate, you want to be forward thinking on this. And so don't make the mistake like we were essential, we've been open, there's been somebody in the office all the time, this is really no big deal. Uh, trust me, it is, it is a big deal for two fronts. One is uh, this is elevated, uh, everybody's aware of it, everybody's had a reaction to it. Um, it's elevated a lot of concerns and stress for folks. And one of the mistakes that I think uh, that, uh, you know, for me, I'm in generally good health, um, Believe it or not, I'm not in an at-risk age group. And so I kind of downplayed it uh, in many ways, completely unaware of the fact that this is a big deal for some folks who I would have never thought it was a big deal for. And you don't want to make that mistake. And so there are staff, there are referral sources, there are clients um, who aren't in the same place where you are or you may be in a different place from where they are. And so you want to treat this with uh, importance and significance so that you don't uh, lead poorly and make mistakes. And you have to, if you're going to anticipate and, and treat it with the importance it should be treated with, you have to prepare. You have to prepare yourself, you have to prepare your place, and you have to prepare your people. And that's one of the things that this conversation is designed to do. Because if you've anticipated and you've treated it as, a, as an important strategy and you've prepared well, then you're going to be armed with information that you can communicate. And I will assert that communication is the piece that gives you uh, the, uh, the competitive advantage. So um, this may seem like a silly question, but why open your office? Uh, in the process of going through this, I've, I've kind of immediately early thought of this as a, a four-stage process. And stage one was, uh-oh, <laughs> uh, uh-oh, you know, what are we going to do here? And you, you had to figure out very quickly, um, were you going to go virtual, how you were going to go virtual, and you had to handle all the logistics to that happening. Second stage 
was very much around, okay, how do we do our fundamental service and maintain cash flow while operating, uh, you know, virtually? Um, then all of that began to settle down. Many of us are in what I would call stage three. Um, some of us are coming out of stage three, which the post-COVID world may present marketing opportunities or present business opportunities, litigation opportunities, service opportunities, uh, changes and in innovation in the way you do service. Um, and so uh, phase, stage three was very much kind of where those opportunities um, lead you. Well, stage four, some of us are already in it and some of us are anticipating it, is um, getting back to the phrase that people are using as the new normal. The phrase that I like to use is getting into the post-COVID world. Trust me, when I say post-COVID, I'm not suggesting that it's going to go away. In fact, it's going to be with us in some form or fashion for a couple of years ahead of us. We're going to be living in the aftermath of something that was completely unprecedented in terms of a widespread national economic shutdown. Uh, that, that impacts us. And, um, and so there's some reasons why I think you really should open your office because it is important in a post-COVID world. And the first reason goes back to the very first time you opened your, an office or your office. And that is, is that your office initially, in many ways, was a marketing strategy. The opening of an office and an investing in that expense was a way of formally recognizing to yourself and to others that you were really in business. This is your place of operations. For many, many people, um, even those of us who don't necessarily practice in a retail way, the existence of our office is the existence of our business. And so um, if you do have or have had um, an office, um, you want to recognize that that wasn't just a place where your basic operations happened. It was part of your overall marketing strategy. Furthermore, um, your office is a hub that serves, your home, serves as your home field for your team. Uh, in other words, it was a place where people gathered and your culture was created, and a large part of what makes you good at what you do and your firm strong at what it does is the culture that is created on your home field. So although the post-COVID world may have you functioning with a hybrid office and some people have liked working virtually and some people may never come back to your off to your office, I believe even though square footage may be less relevant in the post-COVID world, the relevancy of having a home field where your team gathers will be relevant in some form or fashion. So getting back to opening your office is the way in which you accelerate the opportunity to recollect your people and recreate your, your, your core culture. And then I just think that, um, you know, the opening up of offices, the opening up of shops, is a way in which we begin to feel hope about our ability to get to the other side of what we've all endured. Um, I, I live in Central Florida. I can't tell you um, how much attention I was paying and, and hoping for the reopening of the theme parks. And, and you know, Florida's a hot spot now, and, and I actually am in probably one of the hottest flare-up spots in Florida um, where I am. But nonetheless, um, one of the gauges that I'm looking toward are two things, and that is our theme parks opening up and baseball starting. Um, for me personally, uh, all of this shutdown would have been much more enjoyable if they just didn't take my baseball away, but tragically they did. And I can't tell you how frustrating it is for me that uh, Major League Baseball did a terrible job of anticipating that one day people would be ready to watch baseball. And if they had worked out the details with the, between the owners and the Players Association, the possibility exists that baseball could be happening right now, but it's not, and we don't even know when it's happening. And there are people like me who can't wait. Now, I go through this analogy is to say, your office serves the same purpose. That once you reopen your office as a center of operations, it will be a statement of our ability to navigate through this process together into what a, uh, the future, the new future might look like. So don't, don't downplay the emotional significance of that action being taken.
Okay, so there are plenty of reasons. I just wanted to highlight those three to make sure that you're aware of those as a leader. And then um, I want to walk through uh, what I believe are really five steps, five things that you need to do uh, in the process of opening your office. Take a pen, take a paper, write these things down, make sure that you do them. We actually all have a handout to help you with some of this stuff. Uh, it's in the handout section um, of this webinar. Okay. Here are those five steps. Number one, you have to clean the house. Step two, you have to prepare your team. Step three, you have to think through the controlling of your access points to your office. Step four, you have to define for your firm what your social distancing practices will look like. And step five, and I'm going to argue that step five it, the reason ultimately you do steps one, two, three, and four is so that you get to do step five, and that is you get to be a leader that reduces the fear and anxiety that is existing with consistent communication. So those are the five steps. I want to walk through them in greater detail, but I really want to highlight this. The reason that you want to walk through these five steps to opening up your shop because cleaning your house, plus preparing your team, plus understanding the importance of controlling your access, having clarity on your social distancing, creating the opportunity for you to communicate information for, to folks, is in fact a marketing win. Um, among all the other reasons um, uh, for reopening your office and doing it well, anticipating, uh, opening at a time that makes uh, the greatest degree of sense with the greatest degree of responsibility, illustrating that you have taken into care and consideration all stakeholders. When you do that well, you have a marketing win. And when you have a marketing win, you have a competitive advantage. So uh, I hope that I've made the case that this is not just about getting back to you know, normal operations. This is, this is looking as a leader creating an opportunity for the firm to have a success. I, I actually think, you know, in my coaching conversations with most of my clients, uh, the biggest hurdle, we've solved so many hurdles in this process from going virtually to helping staff work from their home and accountability and maintaining billing and, you know, no contact interactions with clients and getting e-documents signed and the courts shutting down and navigating all that. Um, and so much of that has been navigated successfully. The hardest challenge that I think many of my clients have had to face is how to do uh, marketing effectively in a post-COVID world. And uh, we're still struggling on that front for clarity because uh, it's not been easy because you can't always, you know, go out and do a marketing lunch. And some people then like restaurants are open, some are comfortable with marketing lunches, some are not. But one of the things that's just evaporated, and we don't know when it'll come back, um, are good old-fashioned networking functions or times that you go to the courthouse. And when you go to the courthouse, you bump into somebody, you have a strategic conversation with them, you elevate the top of mind awareness, and before you know it, in 24, 48 hours, they have a referral for you. Um, or you go to a community function or a bar function or even a little league game. And all those things that used to be a part of our normal life put us in physical proximity with a potential referral source or potential client, and it generated activity. Well, a lot of that activity is gone and has left the leaders and attorneys shopping for where are my marketing wins to be found? Well, one of your marketing wins can be found in reopening the shop. So uh, let's dive deeper into those five steps. All right, number one, clean the house. Um, there are three steps in this process that are really important. Uh, one, the CDC has provided a checklist. We've actually modified it. We've put it in the material. Use a checklist to make sure that you are doing everything necessary to make sure that your place is clean. Um, by the way, uh, I, will, I will tell you that an important marketing aspect of this is not just um, having a clean house but your, your place looking clean uh, just instills a sense of confidence. All right, so here's where I get to be a little difficult. This is where uh, if you have excessive clutter, uh, now is the time to get rid of it. So uh, please uh, use your um, 
Use the checklist, clean the house. When you clean the house, make sure that you document the process. Here's why. Um, so you don't just clean the house once. One of the things that you're going to have to do to keep your office open and perceived as being a place that the you know, staff and um, uh, clients and referral sources can interact with your office is they, you not only did it once, but you do it on a regular basis. And so you have a documented process that you then train your team on. What are our standards for maintaining a clean house? So this now becomes part of your systems and it becomes part of your training curriculum as well. So um, we've provided some tools to help you on this. It's not just, a, you know, some of you are using outside sources, which is great. It helps before you open up the office. It's not a bad idea to ask a you know, cleaning company to come in and to do it during their standards. But more importantly is, you know, no longer the evening clean, cleaning crew is going to be sufficient to make sure that your, uh, your, your place, your office is perceived as being a clean workplace and a lower risk for contamination. So number one, you've got to clean the house and you got to keep it clean. All right. Secondly, you got to prepare your team. So as I talked about cleaning the house, you got to let people know what you did, and you also got to train them on what they did. You got to document the process of what you did. But more importantly, not everybody on your team has the same health concerns. Not anybody, not everybody on your team necessarily needs to come back into the office. Some of your people in your team went virtual, and their productivity shot up through the roof. Some of your people went virtual, and their productivity fell through the floor. Not everybody is in the same place. And so you want to begin to think about having, uh, not think about, it, you need to be executing one-on-one -on -one conversations with every one of your team members to see where they are, for them to know where you think that they are, and to outline a, a phase or a process that brings them back into the office. And so this may actually lead to a breakthrough in terms of looking at your office in the future as being a little bit of a hybrid workspace. But even though you're thinking about it being a hybrid workspace, there are some essential personnel that actually have to be physically on the premise for to make sense for the premise to operate. So as much as you're thinking about in terms of uh, people being able to kind of come back when they're ready to come back and things of that nature, you're going to be molding that together like a, like a sculptor. Because there may be people who are reluctant to come back, but they, their position is necessary to come back. Um, and this is why one of the first things that we really tried to communicate early on in the process was um, when, when we had to go virtual, one of the questions that you had to sort through is who do you keep, who do you furlough, and one of the key aspects of it, who are the people whose skill sets and contributions to the team are going to be the most difficult to replace? Because now you may end up bringing, needing to bring some people back who are reluctant to come back. And you're going to have to sculpt that and process that, massage that, so that you have uh, the essential players on site that you need, but leaving room for folks who actually their productivity is high to work in a virtual setting. The key here is you've got to have conversations with them, you've got to prepare them, and you've got to envision what your place might look like and what work roles may look like. Fascinating thing. Um, I've worked with clients who um, have uh, poo-pooed and booed and had no interest in working in a virtual setting or even allowing some of their people to work virtually. And uh, this was the event that accelerated that process of change. I think this is a change that's been coming. COVID only accelerated. And that is, is that there's going to be more flexibility in people's workplaces. Here's the good news in all that, by the way. You ready? Uh, you are no longer limited to recruiting talent specifically from your geographic area. Um, one of the things that the post-COVID world will create is geography will be less relevant. Uh, for a long time, when we uh, have the pipeline conversation in Atticus language, we think we say that there are three forces that shape the capacity of your office, your talent, uh, your processes, and your technology, your, your, your talent, your workspace, and your technology. Well, guess what? Uh, technology has now gotten to the place that almost all of us can, can draw talent uh, from all across the country to serve a marketplace 
that is almost anywhere where you are licensed. So uh, keep that in mind as an opportunity is concerned. Step three, uh, make sure that you control the access. Um, this is something that in order to keep uh, um, uh, the place clean, uh, you really don't want people moving in and out of doors. And so you really need to sort of create literally a physical bo bottleneck so the traffic patterns can be uh, somewhat controlled and predictable. A lot of that is very easy, but one of the things that you just really need to uh, let people know in advance is are you accepting drop bys or do people have to schedule appointments in advance? I would encourage, at least for the balance of this year, uh, probably for the balance of this year, that everybody, all stakeholders, referral sources, uh, vendors, um, and clients know that uh, they really ought to be scheduling in advance and notifying you in advance. Make sure that you talk with your vendors about what your policy is, is where they drop stuff off. Find out what their policies are. Um, one of the things that just I think you're going to have to be really cognizant of is vendors not necessarily just having straight in and out access as they used to have. Or the, one of the harder things that are going to be shutting down is attorneys having access to the exit to the back door that allows them to go use the restroom and all those kind of things you're going to want to control your access points because you can have safety equipment that is accessible at your access points. Things like masks, hand sanitizers, there's gloves. I would encourage that those become part of the new office <laughs> equipment that you order on a regular basis um, because not everybody's going to come with masks, but you may want to make sure that they're wearing masks. If you're going to have a mediation, you want to make sure that if your policy is that you're going to be masked, you have masks to provide them. Or if they're going to be wearing gloves, they're going to have them. If it is hand sanitizers or wash stations, make sure that you provide all of those things. If you're going to control access, make sure that you also control the opportunity for people to uh, practice, uh, you know, you know, basic uh, care uh, for their uh, cleanliness. Okay, so you know this has everything to do with good hygiene. Uh, we're going to put good hygiene on steroids, uh, at least for the rest of the. And Dr. Fauci, one of the things he suggests is that if we all do this, we're going to see a significant drop down in other things like flu and colds and things like that. So there's a whole host of good reasons to practicing this. Okay, uh, step four is your social distancing policy. Now, uh, the uh, Center for Disease Control has their set of guidelines, which is great. Uh, it's very helpful. Uh, but their goal, their guidelines need to be tailored to your guidelines. So I would encourage you, don't just simply say practice social distancing. That is, that's room for every individual to define it however they want to define it. So what are your firm's guidelines for social distancing practices? Bullet point them. Make it a finite number of things that you're requiring or requesting people to do whether it's staying six feet apart or not allowing groups of four or more to gather in the office or removing the number of seats in the conference table, whatever it is that is your social distancing policy, bullet point it because you got to train your people on it. And anytime that you bullet point and train people on it, this is where your accountability skills, because accountability is where training happens. How are you going to give feedback to people, letting them know, because what you're trying to do, by the way, is you're trying to form new habits. And those are not always easy. And we generally, as a rule of thumb, don't form new habits without some form of external accountability. Well, in your office, how will accountability be done? And then as things ease, and if they do ease, when you make changes to your social distancing policy, make sure that you again go through the process of training and accountability, notifying people. Don't make people guess on this stuff, okay? Really let people know what your expectations are regarding their social distance conduct in the office. But all of that really is designed to lead up to this opportunity that you get to reduce people's fear and anxiety with an increased communication and greater clarity of communication. So uh, the fact that you clean the house, the fact that you've had one-on-one -on -one conversations and your team has been sensitive to their own health concerns or work style concerns, that you've defined where your access points are, you've made keeping making hygiene uh, a priority at those access points, and you have guidelines for social distancing, gives you the opportunity to communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, there's a funny little question up there. 
um, related to what would you prefer as an experience? Would you rather experience fear or would you rather experience anxiety? I, I think one of the biggest things, um, and I give uh, my colleague Steve Riley a ton of credit um, on this. You know, this is uh, where I'm just really fortunate to have continuous interaction to people who think through these things in on a regular basis and in an intelligent way. And uh, I was uh, facilitating with, with something with Steve and off the top of his cuff, he did this presentation on the distinctions between fear and anxiety. And I know that some of that has been in the material that we've had and I just want to reiterate it. Um, you know, uh, I, oftentimes I, 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 I would jump at the choice of, of, of anxiety, I would think, okay, and anxiety is a low level thing, I can live with it, okay, but fear is sure this terror, your heart's racing, you don't know whether you're going to survive, yeah, give me anxiety over fear. And I, think, I now come to the conclusion where I think I'd rather have fear over anxiety. Uh, I would prefer neither. Uh, you know, anxiety is uh, this low-level hum that is buzzing in the background continuously, whispering in your ear, it's awfully scary out there. There are bad things out there. It's looking over the sea of the ocean and recognizing that there are sharks that swim underneath the water and you just can't see them. And so uh, for many, many, many of us in dealing with this uh, coronavirus, we've had to deal with it in a way that there's a scary unseeable thing that moves out there and uh, you know and 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 there's not a lot that we can do about it and there's not a lot that we can do about it it just hums as a reminder of there's a world that we don't have control over and it just taxes our energy and um, and and really wears us down and oftentimes we are unaware of the cumulative impact that it has now fear is when the shark jumps out of the water. And the interesting thing about fear, when the shark jumps out of the water, it at least immediately presents to us a series of actions that we can take and can, can take some sense of agency over our life and exercise some degree of control. And so what's, what's kind of interesting is, is that we can at least beat back the shark. Uh, anxiety is awfully difficult to beat back. Um, so in this presentation that Steve was doing, it, it made me help me realize that um, uh, the one area where I notice my anxiety levels get up is as I have this mildly claustrophobic and where it really presents itself is when I fly. And the worst time for me in flying is that moment in time where the plane door shuts and the plane is taxiing and it's on the tarmac and it's not going anywhere. And immediately, and I can tell, by the way, any time that there's an unusual delay uh, in the movement of an airplane on a tarmac. Um, at least when the plane is moving on the tarmac, I am getting incrementally closer to my destination. When it is sitting still, I'm going nowhere and I have no control. And so it elevates my anxiety levels. What I have found is that when I'm in that state, there's only one thing that helps. There's only one thing that mitigates my stress level. And that is the pilot communicating to me what's happening. The worst thing in the world is when I am sitting there with no ability to take control over my set of circumstances or my situation, and nobody is telling me anything. And I want to let you know that you're the pilot of your practice. And when you're not communicating to your stakeholders, there are a fair number of stakeholders whose anxiety levels are going up. And so, um, the way that you help combat the overarching anxiety that so many people in our culture are battling and almost all of your stakeholders are battling is you communicate, communicate, communicate. This is what we're doing. This is what we've done to successfully do what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And here is where we're eventually going to get to together. Because when you communicate, 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 you're actually providing a cure for people's anxiety, and trust me, they're feeling it. And you're also creating the opportunity for a win. So if you are not anticipating, or you treat it like it's no big deal, and you've not uh, prepared people for this, 
you are missing the opportunity to mitigate the anxiety that is pervasive in our culture right now, and you're missing the opportunity to announce to the marketplace that your firm is in your community, prepared and ready to serve them under some otherwise difficult challenges. I hope I've not only made the case to encourage you to be proactive and intentional in reopening your offices, but I also have, hope I've provided the tools and the resources for you to do it in a way that just makes sense. So um, I want to leave opportunity for a little Q&A, um, but let me uh, go into that section by just making uh, some simple recommendations. Be wise. Um, you know, don't, don't be foolish. Uh, don't be blind to um, what people are experiencing and what their fears are, um, what their concerns are, and what their hopes are. Be wise, but also be ready. And when you practice being wise and being ready, it will give you the opportunity to be bold. And when you're bold, you get ahead of the curve and you make some recommendations. So in efforts to be wise, to be ready, and to be bold, um, use our checklist and the CDC guidelines. That material is there. It's available to you. Start the five-step process that I've outlined for you in this conversation. And in doing those things, use the reopening of your office as a significant marketing win. All right. Um, with that, Mike, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, bring you back if I can. And uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to take questions now or walk through uh, the practice growth diagnostic, but I'll I'll let you take the lead on that. Yeah, let's walk through the diagnostic, and you can hit uh, you, know, you can click a few times to bring up all all four bullet points there for me. Um, we always recommend to anybody, uh, whether or not you are an active client or uh, somebody who's just getting to know Atticus, uh, to consider having a practice growth diagnostic. And uh, this isn't always a, a one and done thing. A lot of our clients do this annually as well. And with this, you get a, a focused disk advantage and the disk is a um, behavioral analysis and communication analysis that helps you understand how you communicate, how others communicate, should communicate with you and your business management style. And so that you can leverage those things, your strengths and the things that would not be your strengths uh, to your advantage in, in having better communications, better relationships with your team and even with your family. You also get a practice assessment, uh, which covers the uh, solo and small firm foundations of practice growth. Um, we take an overall look at your uh, practice's um, organization, its setup, the processes you have in place, and um, the practice growth advisor analysis is performed for you during an actual consultation uh, on the phone with one of our advisors who has reviewed your disc and reviewed your practice assessment. And that person will also give you the three most impactful actions. And what those are are three implementable steps that you can put forth right now to actually see some momentum move forward in your practice. So even if you don't go any further with us than having a diagnostic, you do at least get some really great guidance and advice on what you can do right now to, to grow your firm and to reach your goals. Uh, on the next slide um, is, you know, what is the investment? Uh, for um, the diagnostic. And it is um, $295. Um, and this includes, again, the survey, the disk assessment, and the report. Um, the disk assessment report is valued on its own at $125. And you get the hour teleconference with our advisor to discuss your, your results and offer those key suggestions. So if you're interested in how you get started, um, on the next slide, we show you sort of a screen grab of our homepage. At the very top of our homepage is um, um, a link where you can get started here, and the yellow arrow points to that. And our offer to you is that if you would like to complete a di diagnostic within two weeks of attending this webinar, and you do so, we'll mail you a copy of one of our best-selling books, How Good Attorneys Become Great Rainmakers. Um, we have had uh, many clients tell us that this was their sort of entry-level way to get to Atticus. They learned a lot in that book and they realized there was so much more they didn't know and they, they wanted the help to implement on the strategies they were learning. But as with anything, whether it is the diagnostic or our coaching programs or workshops, we have a 100% money back guarantee. So that what that means is if you're not satisfied after completing a workshop uh, or uh, attending one of our programs or your one-on-one -on -one coaching or a diagnostic even, 
that minimal investment of 295, if you're not satisfied at the end of that, we will give you your money back, no questions asked. Um, what we don't want you to do is what we call the, the sort of 90 day think about it program. That's where you listen to what Glenn said today, or if you've attended any of our other webinars, and you, you think, well, that's really, that's some good, good ideas and good advice. I'm gonna chew on that for a while. Um, what you don't wanna do is, is just keep thinking about it because that's sort of um, the booby prize of um, not doing anything to move forward. So we'd like you to take some action on that. And even at the minimal action on the next slide is just knowing about our webinars that we do in this series. Um, on July 1st, we are doing a special webinar introducing our new live stream practice growth program. Uh, the practice growth program and Dominate Your Market are uh, traditionally in-person programs. And we've decided to fill the, the sort of vacuum that has been created uh, due to COVID-19 and also for attorneys who couldn't make it to our live programs because, because perhaps they had childcare issues or other issues that kept them at home. So we're gonna talk to you about the live stream practice growth program and all you get with that. We do um, monthly online workshop shops with that. And it's all the benefits that you get in the practice growth program without the travel. We'd also like to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, the link is there on the screen. Uh, all of the videos from the Atticus Advantage series, as well as several others, are available in playlists for you. And we welcome you to subscribe and share those with others and let us know if they've helped you. Um, we have uh, profiles, of course, on Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. Uh, our, our, uh, our addresses are there on the presentation. And I do want to mention that this presentation, as well as being recorded, uh, we also always uh, put together a PDF printout of the slides. And so the, uh, the, the replay video of this will be available on our website um, and you'll be able to download the slides as well as the uh, checklist that Glenn mentioned, which is available to you right now in the handout section of the GoToWebinar dashboard. So we'll open it up to any questions uh, right now. If you are unfamiliar with how to do that, you can use the chat function in your GoToWebinar dashboard, or you can click the hand icon uh, to indicate you'd like to speak um, directly to the group and ask a question or have a comment, and I will call on you and unmute you. Um, so, uh, Glenn, we have one question uh, or comment that came in here. Uh, it said, your story about anxiety on an airplane really got my attention on why communicating to our team is so important. So thank you so much. Um, and um, and that came from Patty. Um, if we, uh, we don't have any hands raised right now, um, but if you have any time right now to ask a question, now's the time to do so. We'll wait a moment and uh, see if any others come in. And if not, then you get an extra 15 minutes in your day to maybe put into practice some of the thinking that Glenn has given you to do. Glenn, did you have any final thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate Patty, uh, you know, recognizing it. it, it all of us, by the way, uh, have various things that trigger anxiety within us. So uh, I know that uh, nobody ever accused me of being um, on the thoughtful or sensitive side. Uh, my nickname when I was growing up was I was a bull in a china closet. I was my nickname, my nickname was Ferdinand the Bull, and uh, and I and I think that uh, many many of us uh, who are uh, preoccupied with how do we lead our enterprise into the future uh, can sometimes do that. I just, I, I worry about, I worry about it in my own leadership. Um, I'm concerned about it in your leadership of not recognizing if it's, you know, the, the trap is, well, there's no big deal to me. Why should it be a big deal to others? And I just, I have discovered quite honestly in, in surprising ways, this is a big deal. And, um, and not just, COVID-19, there's a whole host of dynamics that are going on culturally uh, that has people on, and, you know, in an anxious state. And uh, we need to be mindful of that and sensitive to it. Okay, well, thank you very much, Glenn. Thank you everybody for attending. Uh, once again, watch for uh, email invitations for our next uh, Atticus Advantage Growth Essentials webinar. Uh, it's July 1st and it's introducing the live stream practice growth program. Thank you all and have a great day.